One night my husband surfing the net. And he ran across a real treasure. A real treasure. He said, I want you to listen to this. Well, it sounded like Tennessee to me way back. And I got hooked. I got hooked. Tim Ramey comes from the old school. He doesn't mess around. He's not going to scratch your back. Has a keen understanding of the political situation from where anybody can get it. And at this time, I'd like to introduce you to this man and his wife, Judy. Judy stood with him all these years, and he's, she's kind of like Rick is to me. She has put up with a lot, right? But she's been with him through thick and thin. And for 40 years, Tim Ramey went to jails and prisons in Tennessee. And I'm here to honor him tonight. I want you to come. The proclamation from the state of Tennessee, signed by, by our Speaker of the House and Ron Travis. And I want to read this proclamation. This man has endured like nobody. You're talking about long drives where you're not wanted. You're talking about reaching untold opportunities. And finally, they closed down the jails to the Tim Rays. They can't go in there anymore. But that ministry for 40 years has gone across Tennessee with a blaze of fire and him begging men to get right and straighten their lives out. You don't know the effect of that. You don't know what it's done. You don't know, Tim Ramey, what your reward is going to be in heaven. You don't know. And I want to read this. Wherefore, it is fitting that we should salute those citizens who through their extraordinary efforts have distinguished themselves as community leaders of whom we can all be proud. And whereas one such noteworthy person is Brother Tim Ramey of Kingston, a citizen of the greatest dedication, ability, and integrity. And whereas for more than 40 years, Brother Ramey has conducted voluntary ministry in Tennessee, jails and prisons. In 1978, he was urged by a prison ministry leader to preach to people who were incarcerated. And after one year of wrestling with the decision, he spoke with the Rome County Sheriff and begin his ministry. And whereas under the title Jails for Jesus, Brother Tim Ramey began conducting twice weekly services that included singing and preaching to people under incarceration in Rome County, eventually spread to 16 jails in various counties, including Ray, Squatchy, Bledsoe, Cumberland, Ventress, Morgan, Scott, Anderson, Granger, Hancock, and Hamlin counties. And wherein he was often accompanied on these missions by his loving wife, Judy. And their ministry was one of sacrifice and trust in God. Whereas Brother Tim Ramey has demonstrated the utmost professionalism, ability, and integrity. And he epitomizes the spirit and commitment that are characteristic of a true Tennessean. And whereas we find it appropriate to acknowledge and applaud Brother Ramey for his dedication in the state of Tennessee and its citizens. Therefore, I, Cameron Sexton, Speaker of the House of Representatives of the 111th General Assembly of the state of Tennessee, at the request in conjunction with Representative John Travis, do hereby proclaim that we honor and commend Brother Jim Rainey for his many years of service to the citizens of the state and extend our best wishes for every future success. Would you congratulate?
thirst for preaching. Thirst. That's why they wanted that bill of rights. It's for preachers. With an unhampered. So I'd like you to say a word or two to us. And not, not, not a lot now. Remember, I'm in charge. <laughs> uh, well, I appreciate uh, uh, the sense that Mr. Griffiths has uh, completely deceived me about all of this. And uh, uh, but I appreciate our efforts and our love for truth and our love for God. I can, I can fellowship to my little echo. I don't know when we drop our mics down a little bit. But uh, I can fellowship with people that love God and love America. Amen. 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 I can't fellowship with the communists. No. I can't fellowship with the liberals. No. I went to them, but not fellowship. And I appreciate the Lord and the kinship here among the people of God. We can fellowship together. Liberty, freedom, and justice for all. Our forefathers bought it with their blood, with their sweat, and their prayers. Yeah. And I appreciate our heritage. God on. I've walked through the graveyard. I better pay attention to time. I'm used to the, in jail and prison, they come tell you it's time to quit. <laughs> and uh, you just preach and talk and whatever till they come tell you it's over with. But uh, I walked to the graveyard and was buried on the preacher bridge. He was about 85, 88 years old. And uh, at the Cumberland Presbyterian Church on Mongo Road, old graveyard there. And uh, I walked by, the tombstone and caught my eye. Bernal Johnson was his name. Washed off the board, 1944 in the South Pacific, off of uh, the USS. It's a submarine. Oh, I can't remember that amazing. But uh, I stopped there and talked. Because I knew his mom and dad, they babysitting me as a child. USS Wahoo. We get my age, it takes a little while for it to come up, you know what I mean? But I thought, now, in, in 1944, from the 40s, wrong county was nowhere. Backside of nothing. Old Creeks come in there with the uh, building the nuclear plants. And that sort of made it somewhere noticeable. Otherwise, it's just country. And I thought, here's a young man that went around the world, not to die, but to purchase our freedom. His mother and daddy didn't send him to die. And no doubt prayed earnestly for him to come home. Probably had never been in another county in his life. There it was 12,000 or better miles from home for liberty and freedom. And as I stood there thinking about him going to preserve us and deliver us and keep us, the Holy Spirit spoke to my heart about how old Jesus left the portals of heaven. Hey, Lord. His father sent him in the book of John. And he sent him to die. Yeah. He was the Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world in the mind. God the Father, and God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. I've been asked to explain that. I can't explain it. I just believe it. Just believe it. But I thought, hey, what's just my freedom? He left heaven and came to earth. Suffered, bled, and died on the cross of Calvary for my sins, and not for my only, but for yours also. And he rose again. Yeah. 
on the third appointed day. Amen. Amen. Anyway, he's alive forevermore. Hallelujah. He purchased my freedom. I'm not on parole tonight. I'm not on probation. Hallelujah. I've been pardoned. <laughs> Another died in my place. Another suffered for my sin before God. The best of heaven took the place of the worst of earth. The sin of the Son of God for the sinful children of Satan. The sinless for the, the, sinless for the sinful, the best for the worst. What a price has been paid for this freedom that we enjoy. And I believe, I believe that we have that privilege and we have that right and we have that responsibility to stand for what is true and what God has given us. I'm very, if I may be permitted to use this word passion, I'm not a fighter, I'm not a thug. I've always been rather, really, really kind of a carrot. I was a rough family. And uh, the only thing I know to do if you bother me would give me a rock or a stick. <laughs> it's you run. It's the best thing. I'm, you've done the real tactics. <laughs> uh, but uh, I've never believed in that we should allow evil to overrun us. Amen. Our forefathers. I heard the old times my dad as an old preacher, pastor of little churches all over these mountains. Handfuls of people we pastored out here on uh, Dayton Mountain, a church where the bell tire fell off and the community allowed it to rain in. There's a big hole in the floor. And uh, there was seven or eight, ten people that would gather there once a month. And my dad would drive. Uh, 60, 65 miles to be there to preach to them. So you get stuck sometimes high as five times on the mountain road trying to get to the church. There's no play day other than glory. But the privilege and the determination that God gave me to carry the gospel, tell of Jesus, preach the Bible, to a people in dire poverty. And he did. And he did, and he did, and he did. Right. But I heard I had the privilege of growing up around the very simplest of people, the very common people that made this country what it is, by the way. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. And I had the honor in them old times and hear them sing and they'd say that I want to die on the battlefield I want to die in the war I want to die on the battlefield with glory in my soul Amen. 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 They had the grace and they had the grit. And they, some didn't die. They stood for what was right. They stood for God. God stands for righteousness. They're right. And them kind of people. Hewed out of the wilderness with such tall, such labor. My dad told me working from daylight to dark. And he said that meant you was in the field at daylight. You didn't get up at daylight. You was in the field at daylight. Yeah. And you worked till it was so dark you couldn't see for 50 cents a day. <laughs> and they usually give you some corn or side meat. Because they had no money. And I say this to remind us it's not been easy to get where we are. 
They paid a great price and we live on the crust of what they lived and how they labored. And if anybody should praise God and bless the Lord, it ought to be the people of God. Amen. 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 You've got to sit down. I bless, I bless the Lord.
five, five and a half years of singing in the Mountain Empire Children's Academy, eight years of piano instruction. She's currently self-employed as a subcontractor for Steadfelt in Johnson City for the past three years, and she ministers at the Bancroft Bible Summer Camp. And so she took time from her busy schedule to come and sing us a song. It's nice to have you, Hannah. Okay, sing away, honey.
actually knew some of the code talkers, which is very, very hard to find folks who know them anymore. Yeah. So it's a privilege for me to be here with you. I retired from the police department in Kingsport after 36 years. I was a watch commander the last 25. Went to the FBI National Academy and enjoyed that and learned a whole lot. I want you to know that in law enforcement, there wasn't anything I liked better than arresting somebody and handcuffing them and putting them in the backseat of the cruiser and talking to them about the Lord on the way to jail. <laughs> I've been a lot of Baptists that way. <laughs> I have learned that all the time what you see is really not what you see. And what people say a lot of times is not what they really mean and what they say. Um, there was a lady asked me last week, she said, you ever wake up just really excited and lean over and kiss the one that's asleep beside you and thank God you're alive? And I said, I did that one time, and I can't ever get on an airline again. <laughs> I want to give you some things tonight, and I will try to be brief and be fast. But I find that some of these things, when I talk about them, people have them in the center of their heart, but they have a hard time articulating them. So I want to give you some ammunition tonight on things that swirl around your head and your heart, and you come to the same conclusion that I do. Maybe there's a different way of saying it. You hear the word culture thrown around in the United States for the last 30 years. What does that word mean, culture? Well, it comes from the root word cult. Now, most of the time, that's a bad word. But in this word, it's just a benign word. What it means is there's a group of people who very well may differ, disagree with a lot of things and are different, have different talents and different abilities and different strengths and different weaknesses and they all look different. But they have one thing in common. They all believe in the same transcendental being and the principles of that transcendental being. That's the cult. Out of that cult comes law. And law will reflect the tenets of the cult. Out of that cult will come education. Education will reflect the tenets of the cult. Out of that cult will come government. Government will reflect the tenets of the cult. Out of that cult we come, will come music and art. All that will reflect the tenets of the cult. And that is the culture. Mm. Now you have to ask yourself, okay... What cult is at the center of American culture? Well, whether you like it or not, or the professor at the university likes it or not, the cult at the center of American culture is the God of the Bible. John Adams, second president of the United States in the sign of the Declaration, this is what he said. He said, the principles upon which the founders achieved independence were the principles of Christianity. Yes. Well, I reckon the man would know. He was there. Do you know what the official motto is of Harvard University? Nobody talks about this. For Christ and the church. Go back and look at education. Go back and look at what those men wrote, what they said in the first hundred years of American culture. All of that culture reflected the tenets and the principles of the cult. In this case, the God of the Bible. Now look what the founders intended. Here's what they intended. They understood that everybody has an ethnic background. Okay? Every human has an ethnic background. I have an ethnic background. You have an ethnic background. I tell people I'm half Scotch and half Irish. All that means is half of me wants to get drunk and the other half don't want to pay for it. <laughs> Everybody has an ethnic background. The founders intended for you, when you came to this country, to do two things. To stand with your feet firmly placed on the Constitution of the United States underneath the umbrella called the culture of the United States. It did not matter your ethnic background. When you came to Ellis Island and you got your little booklet, the very first thing you read when you opened the fly up until about 28 years ago when they took it out, but the very first thing you read was a quote from Theodore Roosevelt, and this is what it said. There is no place in this great country for hyphenated Americans. 
You are not Asian hyphenated Americans. You're not African hyphenated Americans. You're not Mexican hyphenated Americans. You're not Italian hyphenated Americans. I used to sing with a group called the Pantanas. They were all Italians. I did not know until they told me why there's so many Italians in the United States named Tony. It's because when they load them up on boats to bring to the United States, they stamped on their forehead to New York. I did not know that. <laughs> <laughs> You're not Italian hyphenated American. You're not native hyphenated American. You're just Americans. Now that was what the founders intended. They understood everybody had an ethnic background. They wanted you to come stand firmly on the Constitution of the United States underneath the umbrella called the culture of the United States, and that worked very, very well. Until about 25, 30 years ago, when universities began to spin a new doctrine yeah. called multiculturalism. Yes. I despise multiculturalism. Amen. It is the biggest promoter of racism in this country. Yes. Because this is what this is what multiculturalism says. It says that all cults at the center of a culture are all equal. And it says, therefore, all cultures are equal. And this is what they say. They say, all you blacks underneath the umbrella, you come out from the umbrella and go over here to your own little group and you do the African culture thing. All you Mexicans come out from under the umbrella and you go over here to a group by yourself and do the Latino culture thing. And all you Indians, you come out from under the culture, you do the umbrella and you go over here in your group and you do the Native American culture thing. What do you call it when you separate people by race? Racism. It's racism. Multiculturalism is the biggest promoter of racism in this nation. And it is fragmenting this country. Yes. Now I want to shift gears about this for just a second. I told you that the cult at the center of American culture was the God of the Bible. And that's true. And that's why the Constitution of the United States is built on the principles of the Bible. Go read it. Go read it. Down at the state house, when I'm down there, I've been arguing for six years every time a bill comes up and it doesn't have equity. Because law gets its righteousness from its equity. It applies to everybody equally. So it's very, very important that when we pass law, whatever bill we're passing, that it has equity because that's where its righteousness comes from. So, what happens in America then when you take a biblical principle that props up a law and you strip that biblical principle out, either by educating it out or legislating it out, what happens? Well, let me give you one. These three things always happen when you take a law on the books and you strip out the biblical principle that props it up. This is what happens. Three things every time. There is... Man-made rules now have to come into play to replace the biblical principle. Once you strip the biblical principle out, it's gone. Now you've got to put man-made rules in there. Man-made rules are never equitable, ever. Because, because law was founded on biblical principle, that's why the lady in every courtroom who's holding up the scales of justice has a blindfold. Why? Because what it's saying is justice and administration of justice does not see you. It could care less who your mama was or who your daddy was or what side of the tracks you came from or what ethnic background you have since everybody has one. It does not matter. She is blind. Therefore, justice is equitable. Now, when you strip out the biblical principle to replace the man-made rules, man-made rules are never equitable. In that process is always the creation of an expert and the loss of liberty. Now let me show you. You believe in private property ownership. So do I. So did the founders. Where did they get that? And why is it so important? Because in most countries, particularly Marxist countries and communist countries, the masses do not own private property. Only the elite and the state own private property. The founders thought it was a big deal. Why? What right do you have in America to own private property? Where'd that come from? Well, it came from Genesis. It's called the Dominion Principle.
principle. When God told Adam and Eve, I'm going to give you dominion over the land and over the animals. That dominionship principle is what gives you the right to own private property in this country. Now, because we were supposed to have dominion over animals, I grew up in southwestern Colorado. We had five horses, a couple of three cows, had a mule. We either shot or raised everything that we ate. <laughs> either elk and deer or what we raised. If you had a horse and it got old, and one day it got down out there and couldn't get up. Yeah. If you couldn't do it because it had been around the family for a long time, you got your neighbor to do it. Somebody went out there and took a pistol or a rifle. Right. And they put that horse out of his misery because it's going to die. Yeah. It might be five days of suffering, but it's going to die. So you went out there and you did that. Try doing that today. You'll be charged with discharging a firearm within the city or within 100 yards of a dwelling and cruelty to animals excessive cruelty to animals, death of an animal. And that's because we started a few years ago to strip out the biblical principle of dominionship. And we have elevated animals now to the same status as humans, sometimes more important than humans. If you don't believe me, go find an eagle's nest. It's got an egg in it. Grab that egg and throw it off a cliff and see what happens to you. That's worth about a year in a federal penitentiary and a $10,000 fine. Oh, by the way, you can kill a human embryo all day long and name a mystery. Amen. Okay, so you can't go kill your horse now. What are you supposed to do? You're supposed to call the expert. He comes out to your house. What's he do? He kills your horse. Does anybody ever ask, why can the expert kill my horse? But I can't. Oh. That's because he's got a card in his wallet and it says, I am endowed by the men who make the rules to be a professional and I can kill horses. Anytime you strip out the biblical principle that upholds law and government, those three things always happen. You replace the principle with man-made rules that is never equitable. The second thing is the creation of an expert. And the third thing is the loss of liberty. You cannot do what you used to do. I'll give you another one. There was a couple in Texas who'd been married for a while. She got pregnant. At first, she wanted a baby. After she was about six months pregnant, this happened 18 years ago, 16 years ago. She said to her husband, take a baseball bat and beat me in the stomach till you kill this thing. And he did. What happened to him? He went to the penitentiary in the state of Texas for death of a fetus. What happened to her? Nothing. You see, there is no equity when you remove the biblical principle. Nothing happened to her. What were they supposed to do? They were supposed to go to the expert. What does the expert do? He kills the baby. Does anybody ever ask, why can the expert kill the baby and the daddy can't? Oh, it's because he's got a card in his wallet that says, I'm a professional endowed by the men who make the rules. And I can kill babies. Anytime you strip out the biblical principle that crops up law and government, those three things always happen. Man-made rules replace biblical principle. They never have equity. There's always the creation of an expert. And there's always the loss of liberty. Now, I want to show you down at the state house why it's so important to pass bills that have biblical equity. A few years ago, the federal government passed a bill and I screamed and yelled. I wrote my senators, my congressmen, and I yelled and screamed. And then the stupid legislature down here in Tennessee turned around and enacted the same bill. Long time before I got here. It was a bill and a law called hate crimes. Now let me show you what happened. Let's say there are two men standing at a bar. One on the left has got a cowboy hat. And a guy comes through the back door of the bar and he walks up behind these two men and he looks at the guy with the cowboy hat and he picks up a gold cane hammer and he hits him right on top of the head and knocks him out for 24 hours. The guy goes to the hospital for three days. What happens to him? What happens to the guy do? Well, he gets charged with aggravated assault. He gets two to five years. 
and a $5,000 fine. But he takes the same hammer at the same time and he says to the guy standing on the right, you look like a queer, I hate queers. And he hits him on the head with the same hammer the same way, knocks him out for 24 hours, and he's in the hospital for three days, just like the other guy. What happens now? Yeah. He gets charged with aggravated assault, gets a two to five year sentence and a $5,000 fine, and then he gets charged with a hate crime and gets an extra year in the, in the penitentiary uh -huh. and another thousand dollar fine. What does that say? Now here's the problem with inequity. This is what it says. It says that the homosexual's head is worth more yeah. than the heterosexual's head. Yeah. It's yeah. worth a year more in the penitentiary and a thousand more dollars. Uh -huh. And equity is gone from the law. Uh -huh. And anything that does not have biblical equity to it in the law smells because then it's just a biased stick mm -hmm. to go beat on people. So, we're in a different place in this country right now than we've ever been. Yes. What do we need? Well, we need a lot of things, but here's what we need primarily. We need Christian people in this nation to get serious about following Christ. Amen. They need to get serious about serving God. Amen. How in the world can Christian people be an influence on their neighbors if they live just as dirty as their neighbors do? Amen. How does that happen? Amen. If we are going to survive in this country, I think that's one of the linchpins is that pastors <laughs> and churches are going to have to begin to preach the Word of God without apology and teach the Word of God with truth. Amen. And that means you can't be lazy. you got to study. Amen. And pastors need to study and they need to teach and Christian people need to get serious yes. about serving God and saving this republic. Yes. There is more evil on every hand attacking this nation. And I'll tell you something else. I think that there is a lot of evil systems that are riding this COVID horse. Yes. Yes. Hold on. Yes. So, at the end of the day, you need to contact your state representative and your state senator and you need to tell them, I'm praying for you and you need to. You need to. I'm praying for you and I'm watching you. Always. Always honor your oath. Yes. And that's what I tell you, boys. Yes. And it's in the center of my heart. I raised my hand and swore one thing in Tennessee to 6.2 million people. And that was that I would always, always defend and maintain the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of Tennessee. Yes. It is those parchments that keep chains off your feet and a whip off your back. Yes, that's exactly right. You need to learn it. You need to learn the Constitution. You need to teach it to your children and teach it to your grandchildren. Amen. And pray for folks like me. Amen. I appreciate that. Amen.
And there's a there's a little tag in there that you can punch in, but we're not your pawns. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, at this time, before we have the Harry come on, uh, on your table there is there are copies of the um, Bill of Rights. There's a little folded up paper. Did somebody pick that up? Okay. I would not, you look like you might be the first. Would you please read the first amendment to the Bill of Rights? Congress shall not, Congress shall make no law respecting or establishing a religion or prohibiting the free exercise exercise, therefore, of right the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of the people peaceably or assembly and the petition the government for the readiness of grievance. Amen. I can name you two men that were destroyed by violation of this, and Lester Roloff and Greg Dixon were both in violation of their, basically their, their, uh, their right. In other words, they had their rights violated and lost their ministries. Uh, the second, who else? Right here. Let's do it Yeah, let's go. Uh, the first part of that is says militia. Hello. They never did read that part anymore. We have a right to keep arms. We have a right to a citizen militia that is well regulated and doesn't mean regulated by the government. It means that no, no cursing, no lottery, no gambling, no breaking the Sabbath. Okay, that was the rules of the Southern Army. Remember right. So we think, like he said, we got to clean up. But normal Michigan militia, all regulations and confiscation, contrary to law, every one of those regulations that has anything to do with gun control needs to be destroyed and resisted. Red flag laws. And I know that uh, Ruth and John Stewart. And these women are bad, and I hope we can get in a shooting war with them. I'd like to live with them. These evil women that would take away somebody's gun because they turn them in secretly. And if there's anybody here like that, good riddance. All right, number three. Who's, who's next? Somebody has another one. Amy, don't you have one? Okay, Dave. No soldier shall in time of peace be quartered in any house without consent of the owner nor a time of war that the manner to be prescribed by law. Uh, what about the Tennessee wildlife? <laughs> you come in your house, go through your refrigerator without a warrant. It's quartered. Number four. Okay, back here. Service. In the last eight years, I haven't heard it. How long has it been since any 
how long has it been since any politician ever mentioned getting rid of the IRS? The next. Okay. Article 5. No person shall be held to answer for a capital or otherwise infamous crime unless on a presentment, indictment of a grand jury, except in cases arising in the land or naval forces or in the militia when in actual service in time of war or public danger. Nor shall any person be subject for the same offense to be twice put in jeopardy of life or limb, nor shall be compelled in any criminal case to be a witness against himself, nor be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor shall private property be taken for public use without just compensation. Byron David, David Beckwith, Mississippi, tried over and over until they got it. Ever heard that name? I didn't know the name. Look him up. Next. Article 6. In all criminal prosecutions, the accused shall enjoy the right to a speedy and public trial by an impartial jury of state and district wherein the crime shall have been committed, which district shall have been previously ascertained by law, and to be informed of the nature and cause of the accusation, to be confronted with witnesses against him, to have compulsory process for obtaining witnesses in his favor, and to have the assistance of counsel for his defense. And that includes hate crimes, and all those red flag laws. I personally was charged with hate crime because I took down a Mexican light. Under indictment by the, my friends and neighbors of the right county right here. Okay. But God saw to it that they ran out of town because they were all illegal. Um, next. We've got another, so who, has, who has another copy of it? Okay, back here. Yeah. Yeah. At common law with a day, a controversy shall cease $20, right? A trial by jury shall be preserved. And no fact tried by a jury shall be otherwise be examined in any court of the United States and according to the rules of the common law. Carolyn Thomas Getty. In and out of court over private property rights. All right, next. Okay. Excessive bail shall not be required, nor excessive fines and or cruel and unusual punishments. Maximus. You know about Maximus? 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 42 U.S.C. 666. All that code, so called deadbeat law, deadbeat dad laws. Health and Human Services took over driver's license. <clears throat> you, you don't pay your child custody, you can't drive. They put that together. So what did they do? Blow away the whole family and kill themselves. You can't drive, you can't work. Health and Human Services in Nashville, Tennessee is in charge of driver's license. Uh, my nephew, we buried him. All right, next. I know we had 10 of those. Okay. The enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the Zoning, building permits, local control. No anybody's ever been to have one of those yellow signs put on the front of your Next. By the way, the Ninth, the ninth Amendment deals with local government and they all these are things and, and i told them head went back the head of the aclu i said you can't steal the first amendment and ignore the rest you have to keep all of them they like that first amendment but they will not keep the other nine okay who's next 
All right, we don't. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. To the 10th, the power is not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited by it to the states, or reserved to the states, respectively, or to the people. And this includes all of the Title 42 so-called civil rights desecrations from the time of what them in Alabama and all of that. We, they lost it. We lost the 10th Amendment right there when uh, John Kennedy and, and Martin Luther King and all the rest of them went over this country under the ADL. I can document everything I'm saying and everybody knows it. They, in fact, I'm fixing to call uh, just a minute, John. I'm, I'm, I'm getting ready to call this away. They put out a calendar. And in February, has that picture in the Capitol building of the Mayflower landing and Martin Luther King superimposed. Help us. Where's the FBI rules, laws that they sealed 50 years ago? And this is my opinion that that's why they're trying to smear the FBI so nobody will believe them when they bring that out. That's my opinion. Every one of these things have been transgressed. But I'm of the firm belief that the millions and millions, and I'm going to say 30 millions based on the fact that, that the book of Isaiah said a tenth. That's 30 million people in this United States are on their knees begging God for mercy and to save our country. And with all of my heart, I know it's going to be saved. And Lincoln said it would never perish. And Lincoln went no doubt, the circuit preacher, he said this nation would never perish. And it will not, because it's built upon the rock of ages. And if we take 30 million dollars to build it back again, we will. Now I believe that with all my heart. I'm, don't talk to me about losing. Jesus is on our side. Amen. And he bears a sword. Okay? So thank you for reading this. And um, at this time, I would like to introduce a, a, a good friend of ours. This man has been very faithful to broadcast over the radio, WBCR. Am I getting that right here? He's a patriot. Harry Rothschild, he puts out this word for years. And he's, he, he is a wonderful announcer, uh, promoter of righteousness. He's held how many years of Bill of Rights banquets in, uh, in the Alcoa area. So it's my privilege to introduce Harry Rothschild and his wife came with me tonight. So thank you very much for coming out. Thank you. Thank you, Freedom. Bless your heart for putting up with me. Thank you, June. It's always a great honor and a privilege to uh, see June and be here for this occasion. Uh, you know, when I read June's bio, I got ashamed that I hadn't been born. This woman blesses my heart. Every time I hear her, every time I see her, because she has been what we men ought to have been 30 years ago. And I'm repenting today. I'm fasting today. I'm fasting until the Electoral College votes on January the 5th. Six. And I hope you would join me in petitioning heaven and giving up something that you cherish because the Creator gave up His cherished Son. And if we can't give up something of our comfortable lifestyle and every time we have a desire for that thing, that we go to the Father and say, Lord, remember the United States of America. Remember our constitutional republic. And remember the blood-bought redemption of our Son, our Savior, and all of those veterans who are on all of these war memorials. We have 428 Blunt County veterans who died in action 
on our war memorial in front of our courthouse. And I meet there as many times as I can a week to pray over those names and their posterity so that the Lord would raise up that posterity of those names on that wall in order to have the new revival and the new brotherhood of believers who will stand up to the wickedness that dominates this culture and praise God for the privilege to live in a land where freedom was born. Amen. So I thank you all. Tim is here with me. I've got a brief slideshow. I knew that Ben, uh, Representative Halsey, was, had introduced this legislation regarding a, uh, the right for the citizens to refuse a mandated vaccine by some health dictator. And I, and I wanted to uh, give you some ammunition. Can we put that slide at least? Yeah. Huh? AM 1470, capital AM. Uh, the uh, the uh, uh, first slide I had up here was to uh, remind us of the fact that in 1892, the Supreme Court in Trinity versus the USA went through 92 facts or notations, references, declaring that this is a Christian nation. In 1940, that same Supreme Court took the prayer, took, took the Bible and voluntary devotions out of school. And they did so, they did so by taking a phrase that was in a letter from Thomas Jefferson to the Danbury Baptist Association, who had written him to say, we want to get this assurance that these Northern Baptists have become head of the governor over here in this state. They won't take prayer out of school or make us do something that we don't want to do. And, they, and, and Ben Franklin, the Thomas Jefferson wrote back and said, no, there's a high wall of separation of church and state. In 1804, he wrote that letter. The Supreme Court in 1940 reached back to that letter and pulled it out and placed it into the vocabulary of that Supreme Court opinion. And ever since then, they've been teaching that somehow this phrase is in the Constitution of the United States. And this cult, this cult of deception and liars who control the culture through the dominant media have convinced this deceived generation who hasn't studied the foundations of our liberty for themselves, but taken the word of someone else as to why we are a nation. We are a people that have been led by convenience and affluence and comfort to take the easy path. And we are about to lose our way on that path. But you know, I think that that's exactly what we need because we need a little bit of confrontation to put the fear of God in us so that we can have the revival 
that the Lord wants to bring in these last days. But I don't believe that it's going to come through our churches. I, uh, and I say that because in 1954 we passed the Johnson Act, the amendment, and the Johnson Amendment converted the churches to a corporation so that they could continue giving tax deductions to their members who were paying tithe. And that said, when they did that, that corporate low standard in the, in the uh, IRS code, 501c3, yeah. said you cannot spend any more than 7% of your total budget on political affairs. Well, that was enough to put the fear of God into them, their God of money. That, who's, that is who is sitting in the pulpit of American churches today preaching, unfortunately. And why it's not going, the revival is not going to come from the pulpit. It's going to have to come from the pews. It's going to have to come from you who've read these verses, who read these parts of the amendments of the, the, the Bill of Rights. And you and I, we need to be equipped with the invitation of the gospel that we've heard from the brother who has been 40 years in the jails bringing the gospel of truth. Thank you, Jim. So, the, uh, so I'm excited. I'm excited about the, the challenge we face with the enemy that is controlling our government. Unfortunately, we are in an occupied land. Yeah. The, the people, as we've recognized, there aren't any patriots in Washington unless their last name is Trump. There's nobody there that's there to help him establish what needs to be done in the way of getting a accountability created. You know, there is no justice. The uh, Representative Halsey, Halsey said, there is no justice in Washington. There's no justice in Washington because there are no righteous people in Washington. Now we just keep moving back if we can. Well, I apologize, but it's not going to get big enough. We'll just just advance it about three or four steps down the road. I don't want to take these people up all night. I want to, but I want to give this information, and uh, there is you would advance it. Uh, the uh, the, big, the, the biggest concern that the listeners that I talk to on the radio have is that we have conducted TEMA exercises in Blount County. And in these team exercises, although it's been 15 years since they performed this particular drill, I still have people calling me and are concerned about it. That drill was one where the students, because there was a problem in the schools, were brought to a central location. And, there was the, and, the, and the drill was to put them in the high school athletic field when you had children from the middle school, children from the elementary school, children from the high school. And when the parents showed up to get their children, the parents were asked to get a vaccination and to make sure that their child had a vaccination. 
So the importance of Representative Halsey's legislation, I don't think can be overstated. So the, so the concern that the representative has for protecting our children as well as our own selves cannot be overstated because of this risk. Next one. This is, uh, yeah, to remind me that the mask, the masquerade of masks, to deceive you into thinking that you're doing a good deed, you're being a hero, is really to let you know and me know and remind me that the largest gas in our atmosphere is nitrogen, and the most important part of our air, though, is only 21% oxygen. And the mask that you wear, you want to change that? filters not only the uh, dirt and spittle out, but it also keeps the air that you breathe out, your exhale, yeah. in the mask. So the backside of the mask retains the bacteria, and it also retains the carbon monoxide that you, and the, uh, the carbon monoxide that you breathe out so that your first breath coming back in is 25% carbon monoxide carrying the bacteria along with it into the deepest part of your lung. Which is why the only state to not have a crisis of new cases since Thanksgiving is South Dakota because they had no mass mandate. Next slide. There's several studies here. I'm not I'm going to just do this in, in uh, the American Journal of Infection Control. Nurses wearing N95 masks on a 12 hour shift increase the level of CO2 significantly in their blood, creating lightheadedness, shortness of breath, and difficulty in breathing. Next slide. In the Journal of Occupational Environmental Medicine, 2018, the more effective mask is that blocking a normal flow of air is the greater the problem. It uh, decreased the oxygen level and increased the CO2 level in your blood. And it did so in, in, at the rate of how heavy you breathe. If you were doing physical activity, you're going to get dizzy quickly, as you've already experienced, probably. If children aren't spreaders, then why punish them and their parents? The uh, Stat News talked about, let's just, let's just skip this. We, we know that children aren't spreaders. Masks prevent COVID. Interesting. This is, this just is a chart that shows that in those states and in those areas where masks were worn, there have been more cases reported. Go ahead. More, yeah. So, the next one, please. This, uh, these three people have written the Great Guarantee Declaration. And they are a professor at Oxford, who's an epidemiologist, a uh, professor at Harvard, who is a, bio, uh, a biostatistician, and an epidemiologist who also is an expert in detecting and monitoring infectious diseases outbreaks the third gentleman here, Mr. the tall gentleman on the right, 
is the professor of Stanford University Medical School physician and an epidemiologist in, and as well as a health economist and a public health policy expert teaching in the college level courses, PhDs, all of them. They, they, they were embarrassed by our children in our country have been imprisoned by this policy of wearing masks and have written this Barrington Declaration which describes what they call focused protection. It's simply the principles of public health that have been ignored by the quote, experts on television and in Washington. It says, look, this disease, this bioweapon, is attacking a particular segment of our community. We need to protect that segment. They need to be quarantined and protected from the rest of the segment, but the other segment, that is the elderly, right? Those who have multiple illnesses, pre-existing conditions, and are susceptible to lung infection. These people need to be quarantined or protected. Everybody else, the mortality rate on this, in this particular bioweapon, is very low, and the rest of the culture should continue to live normally and allow the by allow this this flu to become widespread naturally. By being naturally right, widespread, then the the body's own immune system can create the antibodies much more successfully than a vaccine. I mean, they say a vaccine is 95% is effective. My immune system is 99% effective. And as long as I'm taking enough vitamin D and zinc, you know, I'm bulletproof. And I, and I thank God that he made me this way. And I'm not waiting for somebody to give, pass a vaccine law that says, I'm going to have to get it before I can go back to work or go on vacation or live my life. Amen. People who, who, who act like that are from this culture of control yes. that think they own us. Yeah. When in reality, they work for us. Yeah. And we need to take our life back just like we need to take our culture back. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, the Great Guaranteed Declaration, and it is at gbdeclaration.org. I, uh, I would hope that maybe Representative Colsey can give me a recommendation as to how we can proceed, how I can proceed to get that declaration into the governor's hands or the people at the state health department that would recognize that closing schools or closing down businesses is it is contrary to a healthy culture. Yes. It destroys the economy, it destroys the health, and, and it obviously destroys the future of, of the state of Tennessee. So the Great Guarantee Declaration. Next, next slide. Stop the world control. I just saw and found this this website about two weeks ago. Um, I encourage you to go there. Dr. Kerry Maggi, who is a doctor of osteopathy, gives this wonderful presentation. I, I'm not, I can't, not going to go through all of it with you, but there's two parts in this that I, that I think that you might recall that are significant about this particular vaccine regimen that is being created that I want you to see. Next point, Tim. Transsection. This transsection business is how is what you, is what you do when you break when you break up the DNA and you create an RNA. You know how to, you know how to do, the the DNA is a is a helix, right? 
and, it, and it's a lighter helix. And the lighter helix is split in half down the, the rungs, and the right half becomes a separate RNA. And they pull the three or four hormones, genes, out of this, this right side and reprogram them to be something other than human. And they then put that into a PCR machine. The PCR is not a test. The PCR is a technology that is, that, that is used to freeze and heat a specimen of DNA that you want to alter. And this is the PCR machine, a picture of one. It's been around, the gentleman got the, got the Nobel Prize for inventing this thing in 1993. He came out in 2019 and told them that this PCR that's the test that they've got is not designed to test anything that has to do with this virus. We are being sorely deceived. The, the hydrogel, the hydrogel, You need to see this to want to uh, appreciate it. This little block over here, you can't see it. But it is, it's why you it's why you want to uh, take a look at this website. And that is to go to odyssey.com and look up the um, Dr. Carey. And uh, this is a hydrogel. It's a stamp, a postage stamp size injection that they're going to send in the mail. It has, it has a, uh, it has a sheet of, of uh, injectors, injectors that you press into your skin and they work like a snake's fang as it presses into the skin it, it emits the hydrogel. This hydrogel is not only a vaccine supplement but it is in fact has uh, luminous robots. It has atomic sized robots that are, to, yeah, robots that, that actually uh, are pre programmed to perform uh, functions that I can't recall. Uh, but, they, but the, the point of the matter is that they are luminous that they, you can put a light over your hand and you can, someone can tell that you have been vaccinated with this hydrogel that is stamped on your hand. You might say that it, is, it has the potential to be a mark that would identify you. I don't know. The, the last thing, I, I was pleased to hear Representative Halsey talk about Dominion, because the Dominion company, uh, this came out about a month ago. Dominion was founded in 2003, and it was, uh, It was bought in 2013. Uh, uh, excuse me. It was. It was. Uh, it was. It was. Yeah. It was bought in 2013 by a holding company called First Street, 
and in 2014, it received a payment of $200 million from this communist Chinese control bank in Switzerland. And on October the 8th of this year, it received a final payment of $400 million by the communist Chinese government's three entities combined with a 25 investment percentage investment of the Swiss bank, UBC. And they own Dominion, which is why we have reports of communists, of Chinese agents bringing ballots into Atlanta and into Milwaukee because those states didn't have enough ballots. The landslide of votes were so overwhelming that they didn't have enough ballots on hand to stuff the ballot to be able to run through, which is why they had to run through the same ballots over and over and over again in order to acquire enough votes to defeat the landslide of President Donald J. Trump. Well, so I don't know what the future's going to hold, but I don't, I don't think that we, we're going to be surprised to see the enemy resist constitutional government be to be established in America, which is why I'm fasting. I pray that you would join me in that fast, and that we would not only pray for our president, but those who would hear his orders, his directives, and be obedient to his instruction in their efforts to establish and reestablish justice in Washington and preserve our republic. Thank you for your kind attention. God's 
said he spit you out of your mouth, I haven't heard any call for repentance. That's what the, the, the uh, Passover, the Lord's Supper, is that he would pass over in the time of his wrath. Do you know how many votes, how much interest the counties had with this resolution? <laughs> next. When's the next break? If you have not repented of your sin and you've tried to live a sinful life and dig around in the mud and half in the world and half in the, half in the Lord's way when it's convenient, I would recommend that you take the prescription. I said all over this country, all you have to do to save your country is quit your sin. If my people will humble themselves and pray and turn from a wicked place, he'll save your country. And if you love your sin more than you love your country, you don't deserve it. Yeah. That's all that's necessary for you to give up sin. And you'll be saved in your country. How about that? Wait. You talk about equity. My favorite subject. So, Harry, I appreciate you. I appreciate these speakers. I appreciate you all coming. I would like to be. Where'd you go? Harry, right. Oh, well. Thank you very much. It's just a little bit of bright silver for you. And God bless you and your wife together and give you long life together. There's a couple of business things to take care of. Uh, Erica Scripture has wonderful flags. If you haven't been flying a Bedford flag, she, I call her, she comes by my house at 6 o'clock in the morning on the way to work. Bring me another Bedford flag. I said, Arm of God coming out of a cloud. It ought to be flown everywhere. It was the first military flag in 1774 up at Lexington Concord, and it said, Conquer or Die. And boy, that's a wonderful flag. And she has all kinds of flags. If you need anything, you have cards. You have any cards? She has the greatest supply. Her mother and daddy were super patriots, and we loved them, and they died, what, three years ago, was it? Within weeks of each other. So, and then Dave yeah, we've got the, has a... The little rights calendar for next year. The guy that puts it out is 93 years old. It gets better every year. Ten bucks. So let me know when you want. So thank you for all. I don't know. Do we have any unfinished business? Thank you all for coming. Um, let me just look at my notes a minute and see if we can. All right. I want us to stand. the Lord's prayer. And then when we finish, we will sing the dog song. Our Father, which art in heaven,